So I wanted to start with Chris, because you're kind of the big picture guy. You're working on this hub that is regional, that is helping build up the hydrogen sector in this area. And so talk to me a little bit about what you guys are going to do. What is your strategy for, for creating this kind of new economy, really? Well, thanks, Lisa, and just really glad to be here and really glad that Department of Commerce was able to sponsor. So my other <coughs> job is I run our state Office of Economic Development and Competitiveness with the Department of Commerce and love the Nordic uh, Summit, love being a part of this. So thank you, everybody, that's been here today to support this. Uh, and to answer your question, um, you know, I think the future looks pretty bright. You know, as you mentioned earlier, we, we did win a, a $1 billion grant uh, from the Department of Energy. I want to also thank our state legislature and the governor for giving us some seed capital to support that process to get us going. And we've got another, you know, 5 or $6 billion from the private sector that is matching that. So we're going to build, you know, 17 pretty decent-sized projects throughout the Pacific Northwest uh, in Washington and Oregon and one over in Montana. And we're one of seven hubs like this around the country. Um, and so what's great about it, and Tony, I was listening to your, your speech just a little bit ago, and a lot of the things you're talking about match some of the things we're thinking about too. So batteries are great, the grid's great, uh, that stuff can do a whole bunch of great things to decarbonize, let it do all of that. We're doing a lot to invest in batteries around this country and the world, and that's really excellent. And there's some other places that are pretty hard to decarbonize, big trucks, big boats, big planes, big industrial equipment, fertilizers. So all of those things, like hydrogen's great. You know, battery has a harder time uh, probably on some of those modes. And so in, in the really, really big picture, what I, what I think I really like about what the Department of Energy has done and what Washington State has done to make some policy changes to invest in this uh, value chain is that we're, we're kind of really trying to create a new global energy commodity and create supply and demand of that commodity at the same time. Quite difficult, uh, quite a grand task. Um, but, you know, maybe one day, uh, hydrogen or other e-fuels, it's methanol, ammonia, whatever those fuels are, if, if those fuels maybe one day displace fossil fuel and petroleum as, as the largest global traded energy commodity in the world, like what a great thing, right? Look at all the great stuff we can do. So the task is massive. Um, our focus is on hard to decarbonize and our hub, you know, hubs had to choose. We chose to go for green electrolytic hydrogen. So most of our hydrogen production, I think actually all of our hydrogen production projects are green electrolytic hydrogen. And other hubs have different ways they're doing that with methane reform or other things that, that uh, Tony was talking about. Will you, will you slow down for one second and sure. say what that means? What is the green electrolytic <laughs> hydrogen? All, really what it means is that just, just to boil it down is, you know, if you can, what's your, what's your carbon intensity score? Like the cleanest hydrogen possible. Green means you're using green renewable energy resources. So wind, solar, hydro, those can be used with an electrolyzer to make green hydrogen. So that's what we're planning to do. Uh, uh, hopefully we'll be starting that off later this summer after we get through some paperwork with Department of Energy. Um, and it's gonna be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to working on this more. Cool, and, and just and one more, so it's taking water and making that into hydrogen and oxygen. Is that one, and I mean, and Tony's making it with, um, you know, natural gas. So you can do it from different. You can do it different ways. Different That's ways. What, what I'm talking okay. about is electrolysis. Very yeah. not a new technology. They've known how to do this for a little while, and yeah. you can now go buy electrolyzers kind of off the shelf from many places. And so, yeah, the the science isn't that difficult. It's the what's the difficult part is the commercialization, uh, the monetization of creating this market. That's going to be the difficult part. Yeah. Well, what's I know I'm going to go back to Tony for one more minute too, and just talk a little bit about the different ways people are making hydrogen and sort of your strategy and sort of the the place-based nature of it and why we kind of dig into that a little bit more. Do Got it. Know? Go ahead. Uh, there are many ways to make hydrogen. Definitely, I would say actually Washington State is absolutely right to bet on what he described as ex electrolysis, splitting water with renewable electricity, because we have abundant and cheap hydroelectricity in the state. But that being said, if you know anything about energy, it's like a $5 trillion sector, there is no one size fits all. So definitely there is like, you know, our, oh God, our technology, people call it turquoise hydrogen. There's also blue hydrogen, which is something called steam methane reforming, but actually it's a traditional way of making hydrogen, which emits a bunch of CO2, but people just go around and capture the CO2. There's even something called white hydrogen now where people are finding natural reserves of hydrogen in the ground, and they're hoping there are big reserves and they're trying to mine hydrogen out the round, ground. So there's a whole spectrum, and they all fit different use cases. It all depends on economics, but I'd say, as Lisa alluded to, one of the grand challenges that we're solving is it doesn't matter what, how you make the hydrogen, they're all hard to move around. 
and therefore we like picking back off the existing gas infrastructure because that means as long as you're next to a gas pipe, which is most businesses in the country, we can deliver hydrogen immediately for you instead of waiting 15, 20 years for some hydrogen pipeline to be permitted and built. Right, yeah, and, and, that's, and Washington's not really keen to invest on that necessarily right away too, because it is so expensive to move the hydrogen itself, right? That's kind of yeah, challenges. moving it is a really big deal. Moving it and storing it is, is a big deal, and that the country does need to build more infrastructure for those things down the road, uh, absolutely. And let's talk to Sven, because you would be a customer potentially of Tony, maybe someday. We can set that up after this. <laughs> but talk a little bit about how Corvus is looking at using hydrogen and why it makes sense in maritime. Yeah. Uh, yeah first of all, we are trying to support potential customers of hydrogen in the future. Um, our background is that we are focused on helping the maritime industry to do emission-free operations. And we've done that with batteries so far. And very successfully, we have proven that uh, you can do mission free operations without um, no problem with batteries. But you have a limitation batteries, so there's a certain distance you can do it. For example, the ferry industry has converted now to battery operation, and that's where it makes sense. And, but we also see that the maritime industry needs to go one step further and be emission free, and that's where we think hydrogen plays a role. We have the same challenge mentioned here, that there are limitations with hydrogen as well, space and that kind of things, but there are also a lot of opportunities. You can get that energy on board those vessels, for example, as a hydrogen directly, or it can be through your process, for example, Tony, that you can have reforming process on board a vessel, for example, and carbon capture, and you're still emission-free operations uh, in those terms. Uh, so what we've done, we for three years now working to, together with uh, Toyota, the car maker. So we have now developed an, um, what we're calling inherently gas safe solution, which is a fuel cell that suits to be installed on board vessels. And we are adapting that, that technology now. So we firmly believe there are going to be vessels in the near future, uh, there are vessels already, but there will be many more that will operate on hydrogen and do longer trips, not ocean crossings, but we see the short shipping industry. We see vessels that need to have two, three, five days between the ports. That's where hydrogen can play a significant role. And so you would be in a situation where you would be producing the hydrogen on the vessel or you, you, you produce it at the port and then move it on to the vessel, potentially? Yeah, we, or the technology is we, we consume the hydrogen and transfer mm -hmm. it to electricity, which is propulsion power. Mm -hmm. uh, but how to bring that hydrogen on board a vessel, that's where it's quite complex. There are many ways of doing it. There's many challenges, there's also many solutions. You can bring hydrogen directly on board. Mm -hmm. In that case, it will be compressed hydrogen or liquid hydrogen, cooled down to liquid. Or it could be carried on board a vessel in the form of um, natural gas, ammonia, and different kinds of sources. But then you also need to have a reformer technology where you extract the hydrogen for the fuel cell and to capture the carbon in that case, except for ammonia, which don't have the carbon. So it, it's a role that many, many actors need to work together here to get all the pieces together. We need hydrogen production, we need hydrogen distribution, and we need uh, hydrogen consumers. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk a little more, Chris, about other uses for hydrogen specifically? Sure, and I'm glad you just said the last part about you know consumers. We, None of this works if there aren't customers, right? So we're spending all this money. We're going to create a bunch of supply. Tony's got a great company. We're working on all this great stuff, but we need customers. And so one of the things we'll be working on is set that, that downstream parts of the value chain. So all the fuel cell technology, all that engineering, there's a lot of great stuff going on there. Um, and it's really trying to cultivate, like, you know, who's going, who's going to buy this stuff? And so there's a lot of work, I think, yet to come. Department of Energy is spending a little bit of the original appropriation from the hydrogen hub program on this sort of downstream uh, demand side work. Um, and so, you know, I think there's, there's going to be opportunities down the road. Things that we think about in our state, Sven, I'm glad you mentioned longer uh, duration shipping routes. Yes, we hope hydrogen or e-fuels plays a role whenever Maersk starts building its new fleet and those kinds of things. There's a bit of work to do for those kinds of vessels to turn over. Um, aviation uh, has some opportunities as well. There's some really great uh, battery electric aviation companies, so that, and it'll be great for some shorter routes. Fuel cell can extend those routes a little bit further, maybe a little bit bigger planes. 
folks may know about Zero Avia and the work that they are doing up in Everett to put basically a fuel cell propulsion system on a, an old Bombardier Q400. Um, that'd be one of the biggest plans I've ever heard of that would be run on fuel cell. So there are these other things, I think, uh, down the road uh, that we'll be able to use. But near term, you know, it's, you know, buses and really big trucks and things like that um, here for a while. And one other thing I'll just mention is don't count out um, the sustainable aviation fuel sector. Huge demand. Washington State's doing a lot in that space, too. I'm sure other states are doing quite a bit. But hydrogen can play a role in, in the feedstock uh, to create those products, and there's demand for that right now. You know, the airlines right now, if you could have a drop-in fuel and they could, they could buy a whole bunch of it, they would. They just need volume. And so I think there's a, there's a lot of different opportunities. Again, our, our focus right now is the harder to decarbonize, right? Let the battery do the battery stuff and let uh, hydrogen fill the, fill the gaps where it's a little harder for batteries to, to play a role. Okay. And safety isn't, how does safety fit into this? I mean, people know about blimps and hydrogen not going well. I mean, hydrogen as a fuel, anyone want to speak to that? I can. Uh, try. Uh, first of all, that uh, this technology, it sounds scary to certain people and actors because they think it's new and not tested, but that's not correct. Um, fuel cell technology, for example, Toyota, they've done this for more than 30 years. So. I think it's, it's not about innovation of new technology, it is more about implementation of existing technologies. So in many ways, this is well proven. Uh, hydrogen production is well proven and, and use it in different technologies, in different industries. So of course, it's energy. Energy has there's risk related to any kind of concentration of energy, so it's more about risk management. And that's when rules, regulation, standards comes in. They play an important role as well. And of course, the, tran the transition where the, the user of the energy itself will have to learn about the new technology. So risk, yes, but it's manageable, absolutely. Maybe just one quick addition to that. I agree with everything Sven said. It's not to be taken lightly. It's quite serious, and there's lots of safety standards and protocols, all of which will be employed. The companies working on this stuff are quite, quite accustomed to, to these kinds of safety standards. So it can be done. And you do have to do it quite carefully, and it's important to, to make sure you're adhering to all the, the safety protocols. Um, but when somebody says, like, you know, what about the Hindenburg or, you know, some salacious example that we remember that sticks out about hydrogen being combusted because it's flammable, um, you know, sometimes the, the, the part of my brain that reacts before I think sometimes wants to say something <laughs> like, uh, hey, we all drive around with a bunch of flammable liquid in our car <laughs> every day, and nobody stopped driving cars because of that safety risk, right? We learned to manage it, we learned to work on it, we learned to use it safely. Um, the same can and is being done uh, with hydrogen. And so, we, everyone has sort of agreed, the technology is there, it's available, and some of the infrastructure is not there necessarily to move it around. I mean, what are the biggest challenges? It's just money to deploy systems to create and to use it. It's just that, it's that shift then. Is that what the, what's the sticking point? I'd say three sticking points, right? Today, making clean hydrogen is still not as cheap as making the fossil-based CO2 emitting hydrogen. So you have an economic challenge, although there's a lot of effort, so that, that, that curve should cross. Second is the transportation and distribution infrastructure I've talked about. Mm -hmm. And third is what you've talked about, which is the end application. And, and in fact, it's not just about like the, what, creating a market for people to use hydrogen. Uh, there are technologies that can use hydrogen today, like fuel cells, but there are explorations of other technologies that say running your gas turbines at 100% hydrogen, running your industrial furnaces at 100% hydrogen to create high-grade heat. All those things uh, like haven't happened yet. Uh, actually, the technology is easy, but people do need to retrofit their factories and all, do all those actions to make them truly 100% hydrogen compatible. So I'd say these are like the main three steps remaining to make this uh, several trillion dollar market. Several trillion Maybe sounds just good. In one just quick addition, I mean, we think about, I think about price most, right? I think about the economics of hydrogen. If you don't okay. get price right, it's not gonna work, right? If hydrogen is so much more expensive than natural gas, not going to work. And so if you look at what the Biden administration has said, they've got their hydrogen earth shot program. They want hydrogen to be a dollar a kilogram within the next 10 years. That is very aspirational and good for them. This is a good thing. We should all be working toward that. Right now, if you were to go buy hydrogen down in LA to, to put in your passenger vehicle, and somebody will correct me, I'm sure the market's changed, but it's like over $20 a kilogram if you want to do that right now. Kind of pricey. Um, you know, we think for these hydrogen hubs around the country to work, 
if you can get to kind of between four to six dollars a kilogram, then you're talking about a, a price point to start to launch this industry uh, where it can compete. Hopefully, it, it comes down over time. But that's what it kind of with our, when our hub with our hub economics. That's kind of what we, we think is in front of us. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, it's it's uh, it's temperamental. You know, the economy is kind of crazy. It's going to be a commodity, and so price to me, in addition to the things Tony said, uh, quite quite important. Yeah. Just because you mentioned that this is how hard hydrogen is to move around, the re uh, last month it hit 35 in California as the peak. That's not good. Yeah, it's right. not good, man. It's <laughs> not good. <laughs> so this is obviously the Nordic Innovation Summit. So what is happening over in the Nordic countries in the hydrogen space? I, who wants to jump in? Yeah. We have one ferry operating in Norway on hydrogen. It's called uh, the Hydra Ferry. Uh, we, Corvus, we're going to deliver our first fuel cell uh, this summer. It's going to be on a fishing boat, by all means. It's actually a fishing boat that belongs to a maritime college. So it's already in a hybrid vessel, has batteries, it was a diesel engine, and now we're going to have a fuel cell. So it's more for training purposes. There's another contract out there. They're going to be build two more ferries that have very long, long distance. They're going to bunker once per day uh, up in Nor the northern part of Norway. So the the maritime industry, at least, are starting using hydrogen. Um, the trucking industry have not started using hydrogen much in the Nordic countries so far. Mm -hmm. I think that's more in Europe. Um, yeah, uh, but it's it, uh, and we also see that the hydrogen production facilities are being built um, several places now, as we speak, in Nordic countries. So, are we both? Are we kind of U.S. and Nor Nordic countries kind of moving? At a similar pace? Is anyone kind of really jumping ahead and going to be the king of hydrogen? Queen? <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> Chris. Well, maybe, you know, here's my, you know, we've done all this, friend and I have worked together on things over the years, and we've been to Norway and the Nordics quite a bit to work with them on a whole host of clean technology uh, industry and innovation issues. Um, what my In my head, what I kind of always thought is like, hey, you know, the EU and some of the leaders in Europe that are really focusing on, on decarbonization, they've sort of had these policies in place probably a little bit longer than than the United States has. Uh, certainly Washington State has been a leader with progressive climate-related policies and m many in the last four years, thanks to some members that are here and, and Governor Inslee. Um, so we've kind of been doing some policy things, but the United States never really put a bunch of money down. We never sort of made that down payment that folks in the EU and other some of the individual nations have done. And so um, you have these really great innovative companies, many of them are in the Nordics that are doing making are leaders. Uh, the boat builders, the vessel manufacturers, the propulsion system folks, really doing a great job of pushing the envelope to try to push this uh, this innovation forward and, and meet our Paris Accord uh, goals. Um, now we have our big down payment, IIJ followed by IRA. Uh, this is good news, and so you know we can show up. You know the president now gets to show up at the COP and say we did pay. We we are doing this. Like it's a really great thing. It's one of the great legacies I think of uh, President Biden's administration is that we are investing in the future of infrastructure. So now we've got some policies in place. There are really great policies on low carbon fuel here on the West Coast states, including Washington, and we've got some funding. It's a little carrot, it's a little stick, and that's what we will need more of that. We'll need to keep tuning these policies to make sure this stuff can take off. Um, but I think we've, we're kind of trying to catch up in some ways, um, and, and the president uh, took a big step to do that with these, uh, these bills. I, I don't want to go Debbie Downer, but if the administration should change and the funding becomes less certain, is there enough momentum to kind of keep this ball rolling. I think if we knew that, we'd have a lot higher paying jobs. Okay. I don't know if we can answer that question. Does somebody else want to take yeah. a crack? I'm optimistic uh, for two reasons. One is very real politic. Uh, well, tweet this, but don't attribute it to me, right? The, I, there's an irony situation that most of the IRA funding seems to be going to the red states because they have less permit issues, so they're building things faster. But there's a beauty in that because if a lot of the IRA funding is going to red states and you know the IRA is set by Congress, I mean, they might find it very hard to kill the IRA even with a uh, transition in government, pol uh, you know, in in, uh, in in the election. But second is at least what my company has has seen is that I mean the IRA like the 45e subsidy isn't even out yet, and we're still getting a lot of orders and tractions. And it's actually down to the fact of the good work happening at the state level. Because a lot, like, a lot, the biggest customer segment for us is utilities. Mm -hmm. The utilities actually care very little about the federal state regulation. The utilities are buying our technology to clean up because of the state level regulation. 
And so as, as long as the states keep up their good work, I still think decarbonization will make progress in the United States, although maybe we'll lose the race to, to Europe. Uh, <laughs> but it's okay, competition is good, no matter what the planet wins. The planet and wins, I, yeah. Far be it for me to speculate, but I guess. Okay, well yeah. I, I think the only thing I would add is I, uh, you know, and I couldn't predict what's going to happen uh, after November, but um, I'm heartened by a couple things. Uh, it's not just government policies anymore. It's not just government saying thou shalt do X, Y, or Z with your energy strategy. It isn't just that. Uh, there's money being spent by corporations. The big oil corporations, most of their R&D, a lot of their infrastructure money is being spent on clean technology. That's, in, that's interesting to note, and that is important. Uh, hedge funds, venture capital funds, private equity firms, it, it, you know, one of, the, one of the stats we like to talk about a lot is the, the number one uh, industry where funding, private sector funding uh, crosses the international borders or foreign direct investment is clean energy. Everybody thought it was AI or life sciences, plenty of money being spent on those things too. Clean energy is in vogue, good for us. So it's not just you know, the, the liberal Democrats that really wanna do their little climate change projects or whatever pejorative you know, term somebody might use on some news station. Um, lots of people are spending money here, like private companies are spending money, hedge funds are spending money. That's interesting and so uh, maybe, maybe that means that it's a little bit harder uh, to turn that ship around. Okay. Oh, let's let's play on the ship thing. Sven, how <laughs> soon maybe will I be able to take a ferry up the inside passage that has hydrogen fuel and and gets me up there somewhere fun? I think I might be retired for that <laughs> one. <laughs> so that's gonna be my early plan. Uh, no, it, it could happen very fast. I just want to back a little bit to uh, okay, I mentioned sure. too that um, to describe to get this green shift going. Um, we have a saying in the maritime industry that um, a chain is just as strong as the weakest link. Mm -hmm. And we all know what happened, and if that snap, the chain is not functioning anymore. I think that's what we need to do, that we understand that there's multiple processes here to do the green shift, and is identify what is the weak links, focus on them, strengthen them, and continue, then there's a new weak link, and get that one up and running, and that's collaboration is the point to have a strong chain. From the production to the consumption of the future energy or energy carriers. Uh, in terms of timeline, uh, we are limited to be a technology-driven company that provides solutions to ship owners um, and uh, ship designers, etc. So I have to challenge them as well. But uh, if there are hydrogen available quite soon, if you find an owner who want to go for it, if you have some government support, it could happen pretty soon. Hopefully, that we can. All right. Take that Let's hydrogen okay. cruise. Cool. <laughs> Sounds good. I think we're out of time. Um, thank you so much to the three of you. This has been a lot of fun. I, it's positive. There are challenges, but it's really exciting to hear about this. So thank you. Thank you.